Hello guys, uh, I'm here with a good friend and a former colleague, um, his name is Dimo. Uh, Dimo, then uh, in a while he's going to introduce himself, but uh, today I'm going to focus this discussion a little bit uh, in an open interview with Dimo, uh, because he has a lot of experience moving between academia and the industry and he knows the market as well because he he's been moving quite a lot back and forth um, which is good i think because he educated himself and then he goes back in the industry but i want to discuss with him and to talk uh, how we could potentially close this gap between academia and uh, the industry and what are the problems underlying the current situation uh, talk about what could be better, what could be worse. Um, so today I'm going to keep this discussion on this open interview level. And of course, Dimo will also uh, tell us uh, uh, what what he has to say and, and uh, where he wants the, this discussion to go. Mm -hmm. So um, without further delay, uh, please, uh, Dimo, introduce a little bit yourself. Tell us. Uh, about your background and yep. Okay, thanks Dimitri. Uh, my name is Dimo. I am from Bulgaria originally, but I have lived, uh, as you know, many years in Germany and I always been uh, very interested in uh, cartography and geoinformation and also geography, but geography is not the main uh, focus, which we will get later to. <laughs> We're gonna criticize geography a little bit today. So my background basically is um, geography and geoinformation. We started together in the uh, University of uh, Karlsruhe and then I moved on to the governmental sector. Um, then I moved uh, to industry, then back to academia as a research uh, assistant for university. And then again to industry. And why so? Because I, after uh, passed through all these, um, let's say, three main sectors of, uh, yeah, of employment or society, I found out that uh, the the most the the yeah the, the fastest uh, driving and most motivating uh, sector is definitely the industry in terms of remote sensing and uh, geoinformation, rather than academia and uh, government sector. Yes, okay, of course, uh, I can debate against this because I'm uh, more of a researcher, but uh, of course, this is also a little bit personal and depends on what yes. someone wants to achieve and what are his general targets. Uh, but um, uh, generally, I, I would like to ask you, like, um, what, what, what do you think was beneficial for you that you moved between all these sectors or would it be more uh, beneficial for you if you have just sticked with the... Uh, uh, market with the industry mm -hmm. because of course you were in the industry and then you went back to academia and then you came back to industry so uh, and and before you you worked for for the state in Germany mm -hmm. so um, I mean do you think would be better if you had just stick with the industry or it was beneficial for you to see all these different uh, sides and decide yeah definitely yeah, definitely it's always beneficial to look outside uh, the window and to see more from life or more from society more aspects more facets uh, of course the disadvantages of this is that you in, in this case uh, for example, if i would have stayed longer in academia i would have become a better researcher um, not as good as you but <laughs> <laughs> still <laughs> still yeah. better than i am now so this is the disadvantage you understand so yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course, if you want to do something really good, you need to focus and do it a uh, really long time. But if you want to see many aspects, you have to uh, move between them. You know? Okay. Um, I want to continue by asking you, so what, What? Uh, I mean, we are located here in Germany, in Europe currently. So, uh, you know, we, we I, I guess we know better how the market works in, in this uh, European, European level. Um, uh, so I want to ask you what, what what's your opinion about how the the market is moving now out there mm. in, here in Europe? I mean, with a focus in Europe, because I know that in US the things are very different, and uh, maybe in China I have no idea the things. I guess they're also very different in relation to US and to Europe. But I want to focus here in Europe a little bit because this is what we know better. So tell me a little bit. What do you think about the the current? The, job market here, the, 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 the current status of, of the 
But which, which one? You mean uh, remote sensing or geoscience uh, in general? Or uh, like let's, I mean, because here we are focusing more on remote sensing. Yes. I, I would like to know more your opinion on remote mm -hmm. sensing, but of mm -hmm. course, if, if you want to say some information about the geo field, generally, mm -hmm. you're, of course, uh, welcome. Yes, okay, let's, let's discuss first the remote sensing part and then we can uh, generalize to the broader, wider geoinformatics field. Yeah, so everyone knows that USA and um, uh, yeah, Great Britain or UK has some much more job opportunities to offer in uh, the remote sensing field or uh, even the governmental sector as well as in the industrial sector or also in academia. But okay, in, in terms of the US, this is maybe just a cause b um, through the size of the country, through the size okay, of the Okay, let, let's focus in Europe. Let, let's yes, yes. I mean, I think for now it's, mm -hmm. it's not... Uh, you know, uh, it would be wiser to stick with, with Europe yes, and okay. not just with the job market, but also with the company side. I mean, are there enough companies? Mm -hmm. Are there enough projects out there? Is there enough funding? Mm -hmm. Like uh, generally the, the, the status of the market, not just the job market. Of course, yes. the job market, mm -hmm. I think it's, it's kind of a mirror for the situation. Mm -hmm. If there's yes. no companies, if there's no projects, then mm -hmm. uh, of course there wouldn't be many jobs either. Yes. So I mean, definitely with the emergence of the free Landsat data 10 years ago, and then of course the Copernicus program opened um, like a, a huge landslide, an uh, avalanche of uh, new companies or um, how to say, or opened new possibilities, opportunities for the older um, established companies. In this case, so in general, you have to say th uh, that that the number of companies is growing, um, but it's also related to the startup uh, aura atmosphere, where many people, you know, uh, were founders of a certain uh, um, startup in a specific field. So this happened also to the remote sensing field, and uh, as in um, the other fields as well, uh, a lot of chaos. Uh, emerge in the beginning, so they have uh, a lot of uh, companies which also disappeared after a while, and then it took time to see which company uh, focused on uh, which topic. So in general, I have to say that um, uh, there are certain companies who found their field and focused there, while others are more uh, general. Um, but definitely the number increased. Yeah. And do you think there's space for more companies? There's space for uh, more innovation or yes. is it saturated already? Yes, I mean, if you, if you really think creative in a creative way, you can build so many useful applications with information technology or um, and geoscience or remote sensing. And definitely, let's say in the fields of uh, precision farming and agriculture, there are many companies who emerge there for farm management systems and um, uh, crop monitoring and agricultural planning but uh, on, on the other side there are also other fields like uh, let's say uh, alpine environment or um, coastal environment and <laughs> also urban applications so there are many many uh, different um, opportunities there but i think it's it's a little bit in my point of view, because I um, was a founder of a startup, uh, and um, what we encountered is a problem was, of course, the, the, the funding, but also the added value of this and how this added value is perceived by customers in the end. So, yeah. okay, you do, do get mm -hmm. the, the, the first point you just mentioned. Why do, why do you say the funding was a problem? What, what do you mean by that? I mean, how uh, in the in general public the understanding of data and information uh, how much value it is given you know so in my in my point of view um i would like to see the value of data and information to be higher than it is now so especially for uh, in our field you know so it's you and and i think it's very important to underline here that i mean many people think like uh, okay how expensive is to uh, you know to to build data um, in, in, I mean, we have huge databases from, uh, you know, for, for self-driving cars with, with yes. semantic cementation of environment. But mm -hmm. I think there everybody can do it. You, you, you can hire people, you know, uh, through mechanical, Amazon Mechanical Turk, for example, or put them to annotate huge data sets for, mm -hmm. for, 
uh, cheap prices, but mm -hmm. the, the thing with remote sensing, is you cannot put a person who doesn't have any idea, for mm -hmm. example, on spectral values or on glaciers to, to, to give you like uh, contour annotations of yes. glaciers, because maybe you need to analyze, maybe you have to have some expertise to do that yes, work. Yes, you need expertise. Exactly. Expertise, and, yes, and yes. you know, people say, ah, okay, you know, uh, I don't know, 10 images in, in self-driving car, they mm -hmm. cost uh, 20 euros. Uh, you know, why in remote sensing you're asking me 2,000 euros, you know, but yes, exactly. I, I guess, I mean, you would agree that the, 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 because the, the, you know, the computer vision images are cheap and you can find them everywhere and everybody can annotate them mm -hmm. because everybody can make the contour of a building. Yes. There's not an expert. Everybody has this uh, own uh, recognition uh, <laughs> exactly. concept of the But image, on yeah. the other hand, if you need someone to yeah. analyze, I don't know, the material, of mm -hmm. a building, then yes. uh, through f through an image looking the spectral values, then you cannot just you know hire somebody who has uh, uh, no expertise in the field and, and tell mm -hmm. him okay you know you have to understand the different material you exactly. have to analyze the exactly so remote sensing is a scientific field which was also let's say um, hijacked a little bit by geographers and uh, because in remote sensing offers a lot of applications for geographers and hydrologists and uh, also biologists in a certain way. Not only so these, yeah. I think also GIS, all these maps awesome. that people, uh, everybody is out there wants to use Google Maps, for example, yes. but uh, especially in Europe or in US, I, I don't know how much they're using mm -hmm. them in Africa, but uh, the thing is, yeah, awesome. I mean, how would you extract this information Mm -hmm. uh, from the raw images to get the map. I mean, people don't think about it, they just want the map. But it's exactly. a huge process yes, and a, a huge and field it, of study. I think it's also, uh, let's, uh, uh, I think one of the problems is also the, the, um, the lack of uh, public, uh, um, let's say, propaganda of our field in this case. So it means that if you have open data, open source data, ah, look, the Copernicus program is open. So it means that everything is for free. Google Maps, uh, Google Earth, everything is for free. Why? Wha what is the benefit? You know, when people ask you what are you doing, remote sensing, they are like, okay, what is that? And you're like, ah, you know, Google Earth. Ah, yeah, of course. So, and think uh, our we have to do much more propaganda about the value of our work, and also how to motivate other people in other countries to do it. There's also not only a big discrepancy here and between the different sectors, but also if you go to a, a um, less developed country than Germany, it's a huge. Um, discrepancy. You know? So to talk a little bit about more about the data because we started, what do you think about the Copernicus program? What, what do you think it will lead? Would it make mm -hmm. uh, big change in the game? Uh, mm -hmm. Where do you see this coming with it artificial intelligence, which is the focus also mm -hmm. of our channel here? Uh, oh, yeah. Where do you see it going in the future? What what mm -hmm. what are the prospects? What what are the challenges? Mm -hmm. And uh, also, you know, what, what uh, can be achieved mm -hmm. through this? Yes. I mean, uh, basically, the majority of our data, what we use in our company, is um, Sentinel-2 data, uh, which is by far has a much uh, higher temporal resolution and, and higher revisit time than uh, uh, the Lancer data already now. So this has already um, equalized the usefulness of Lancer data. So we can say we use both very much, and the Copernicus program was very useful for that. What I want to, to see more is uh, to have more uh, processing frameworks and more also applications for Sentinel-1, the synthetic aperture radar um, data. You know but I guess the expertise there to understand yes. the what's happening, the signal, uh, everything, it's, it's much higher. Yes, the, the w if you work with SAR data, SAR data is much less intuitive than working with NDVI, you know, uh, vegetation indices from spectral imagery. So, of course, the amount of experts is less in the <laughs> radar uh, processing uh, industry than in the spectral. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I've been looking many times uh, SAR data mm -hmm. and I'd be amazed by what I see. Um, Military, of course. Yeah. Applications, maybe yes. they use yes. more SAR data, but mm -hmm. also for, for the average user, someone, let's say, mm -hmm. who, who makes a start, that maybe it's hard to get into yes. SAR, yes. even though the data are yes. available. It's I also mean, harder to, uh, to sell it. I imagine you have a customer from uh, Africa, because in my uh, previous, not the current one, the previous startup, we uh, worked uh, a lot with uh, African and also Central Asian um, customers and agencies and it's 
already hard to sell to a non-expert the data uh, if he doesn't even know that this exists or how actually it's composed of. So okay, <laughs> so he wants to see the raw data where you extract the information yes, from, yes, yes, yes. and when you show him this, he doesn't have trust in you, or how, how does it play? No, he, uh, first of all, they uh, don't even know the possibilities of radar data. But and, yeah. why would they see the raw data? Probably they want an information from They it. want just to, 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 to there is an understanding that by seeing the raw data, you can already extract information out of it manually. Mm. <laughs> right. That's the, the biggest, let's say, discrepancy in automatization of remote sensing processing in developing countries. Yes, that's the a uh, lot of manual work. Okay, yeah. to go back a little bit more into AI, um, I would like to ask you, so we have all these things related with uh, uh, Sentinel-2 that we're discussing now, and I guess the most of the people are uh, downloading or processing their data in the Google Earth Engine, if they're researchers, or, uh, or I, I don't know if you have, or, yeah. or Amazon Web Services, mm -hmm. uh, yes. mainly. Yeah. Um, how much uh, this benefited the whole process of artificial intelligence information extraction mm -hmm. from satellite data. And I want to ask you also how difficult it is to someone um, exclude Amazon Web Services from the loop and, and try to do, you know, mm -hmm. all the processing himself. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. First of all, about Google and Amazon, of course, great providers of data and great providers of cloud services. But of course, dangerous because they're monopolic, you know. So maybe it's uh, good to be more independent from them. On the uh, other side, was um, uh, about using what uh, AI environments of these. So yes, I and mean, and how would you, for example, how much the mm. cloud have benefited? Uh, these uh, cloud services mm. have benefited, mm. and Definitely. how much you can do we these things on your own. Definitely. So. Okay, depends on the application. If, let's say, we want to produce a simple land cover map with machine learning methods, maybe we will not go even into deep learning, we will just use an artificial neural network or even use gradient boosting algorithm to produce a very basic uh, land cover classification image. With okay, but on the extent, yeah. for example. But on the extent, of course, if you, if you are forced, actually, you're uh, basically, in a certain way, if your labels or if your data becomes more complex and non-linear, you're somehow forced to use a more complex framework, and then you're, we're ending up in a new field, basically, with TensorFlow. Yes. yes so in this case, the cloud benefited a lot. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. I mean, theoretically, you can build the algorithm on your own, in your mm -hmm. personal, uh, workstation. Yes. You you build a powerful workstation. Could you do big processing of data in your personal workstation, or you need the cloud? You need to um, the, I, I don't know the, the data that you have to download. It's so big. Yeah, of course, the yeah. computational power you you want it so much that you couldn't have it in your personal workstation. No, in, in our case, it must be in the cloud in, uh, because there's no other way around it. Also, it not only because of the processing, but also because of the data provision. The cloud also uh, provides you the possibility to share your um, also added value data with customers. Let's say. So you couldn't do it on a. I mean, so the customer requires you to have the Amazon Web Service in a sense. Yes, yes. Not only Amazon, also different. Then not. Uh, I don't like this uh, monopolic thing, Amazon and Google. There are also other cloud providers who are for processing your data. It's so it would be impossible for your companies or for you even to think that you could build a company without actually having these kind of uh, uh, Amazon Web Services or cloud services. No, you, you, you need them. It's impossible today. In, in the industry, I would say, I mean, I know some remote sensing companies who uh, work without the cloud, so they are do standard project work. Uh, they're what do you mean by standard project work? Standard project work for me is producing reports for, let's say, environmental uh, agency or European Commission and doing, a, let's say, a dead end project with no. Um, Users, I just uh, let's okay. Say let's not not uh, criticize yeah. it yet because okay, I want yeah. to focus on the cloud thing. Yes. So uh, for now, maybe we can talk mm -hmm. about this later. Mm -hmm. But so practically, if by experience, what's the percentage of the companies in the remote sensing field that they actually use a cloud service? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. I, yeah. I have no idea. Okay. But, <laughs> but I I tend to say that the newer companies somehow tend to um, use uh, more more cloud services than the than the older and bigger companies. Mm -hmm. I think that the bigger remote sensing companies 
are uh, somehow counting on the um, supportive uh, <laughs> aspect of the smaller companies where they can also outsource some um, work. Yeah. I mean, what is interesting, and maybe I'm going to be presenting this in the channel, uh, is that even big providers of data, Digital Globe, which mm -hmm. is the biggest provider in the world of satellite imagery yes. with the world view, uh, with the world view satellite and before with the quick birds and, and so on. Uh, all these uh, people in these big companies, they, uh, at least Digital Globe, they decided to move all their archive into the Amazon Web Services mm -hmm. and, and, you know, uh, actually uh, drop their own system with magnetic tapes for storing uh -huh. the data and so yes. on and so yeah. forth. So uh, mm -hmm. when, when you see the biggest company in the world, uh, which, which also, I guess, has very uh, secure data and the data that they don't want to distribute openly around, they, they trust mm -hmm. these kind of big institutions, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it says something about the future of things. Yes, but wouldn't it be also nice to imagine having the same end-to-end um, -end, you know, framework of providing data, uh, such as Copernicus data, to have it uh, also for spot or for other high-resolution commercial satellites? Like uh, um, QuickBird or Worldview, or yeah, wouldn't it be nice to have something like that? Yeah, I, d I don't understand exactly what you mean. Maybe you can elaborate a little bit. I more. mean, uh, there's also a huge uh, discrepancy with the price. Like, imagine one uh, square kilometer of um, of um, of uh, how to say of uh, a tasked uh, uh, Pleiades or Worldview data is beyond 20, 30 euro, you know. So yeah, of course, but yeah. the sensor has a much smaller uh, area that it covers. Mm -hmm. So so, so the swath of mm -hmm. the image is much smaller. So I guess uh, you cannot ask for, for the same thing as a lower resolution uh, satellite, which can capture this same area much, much quicker. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And of course, the sensor technology is not the same and mm -hmm. so on. Um, Anyhow, uh, let's go a little bit back in the dead companies you were talking about, and uh, what what exactly do you mean by, by these uh, not dead companies? Sorry, uh, you dead, said dead, dead, pro dead projects. about dead end projects. So in my in my terms, especially. So this so, so you're referring mm -hmm. now. You're not referring to academia, but you're referring to the no, market. Both, 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 both. Uh, some let's say some more conventional companies who are doing, a, let's say, a feasibility study and a project. And then no users are, let's say, identified. No uh, customers could be identified. Where actually the proof of concept somehow uh, almost failed. But uh, you know, it's, it's a very marginal thing. <laughs> and also you have the same thing in academia, where you have uh, basically um, dead end projects. We, you produce tons of data. You use tons of resources. But for what? I mean, you okay? You prove that your method works for this specific area in terms of geography. Um, this algorithm worked somehow, but uh, and you know that it's a pity, it's an interesting thing, and your method will not be used anymore. Uh, but why won't be used anymore? Because it's just a science for science itself in this case. Okay, yeah. so, so you want to say, for example, that the science remains closed behind closed doors in, in a scientific lab, and that's it. In in some cases, yes. Okay, not, not but not always, yeah. what if, like with this open trend now of uh, open sourcing your code, if, if you would open source your code, especially mm -hmm. if you are an academic institution, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that wouldn't be that beneficial. Like, because yes. then everybody can take the code, everybody can find it, they can do amazing stuff with it, uh, reuse it, uh, mm -hmm. check it out. Uh, yes, yes extend it yes yes that i mean that's already happening uh, in github you know so it's uh, it's already happening mm -hmm. not only in github but also in <laughs> and, and in uh, other uh, what i want to say of yeah. course it's it's yeah. it's a very simple uh, way of doing it now i mean we, we're not in the 80s where you know sharing your code would be mm -hmm. something very difficult somebody may i don't know had to write you a, mm. uh, an email if you had an email address or a mail and then you would send them a disk mm -hmm. with your code. And mm -hmm. I mean, now that the sharing of the information is so quick, everybody mm -hmm. can use a Git uh, repository and upload yes. his code and, and yes, just yes. make it available. Yes, so, yes. I mean, don't you think that all these companies, if they work for, I don't know, a big institution uh, for, for, for mm -hmm. a project, 
with ESA, for example, they mm -hmm. should upload their code. I mean, ESA is uploading their code. Yes, but, but the, of course, the ESA toolboxes are open source. Yes, yeah, of course, yes. Yeah. I mean, some companies do that, but of course, you, you have to uh, understand that some companies uh, cannot do that because of uh, uh, privacy policies. Also, they. Uh, it's also in the interest of a, a company to uh, have this, um, you know, to, to keep knowledge inside the company and not to give it to everyone because it's also a, um, yeah, a success of the company. Yeah, of it course, I understand. It, yeah. But if they mm -hmm. have a specific contract, for example, with ESA for a project that says, okay, this would be open sourced, then, you know. Uh, yeah, then it's, then it's possible, yeah. But also in academia, you know, it's uh, okay, uh, not only about outsourcing, but also about working together. And uh, there are many projects which are very similar and even uh, even some of them are running parallel in the same country uh, let's say if you have a remote sensing analysis uh, case study in uh, uzbekistan for example <laughs> okay so you have uh, two or three projects which are more or less parallel very similar and t completely different consortium and why are not let's say using it's what i encountered it's very hard to use elements of one project to integrate them into the another so it's not completely let's say a dead end project but also interconnected with each other and i, I there's a big lack in this in academia of working inter interconnected yeah and at least what i encounter not of i'm not generalizing of course I mean, I, I'm looking a little bit to the future here, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, by, by looking into the very interesting technology of the blockchain, you know, mm -hmm. it's a very nice way to standardize it. It's a very nice way to have a continuation. Mm -hmm. Maybe, um, I mean, of course, I, I, I haven't thought about the framework, but maybe it would be a very nice way to, because the blockchain would be open. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you're familiar with the technology, you build Not the so blockchain. Uh, uh, so, okay, also for, for our viewers, Theoretically, you build a blockchain where all the information is there. So, kind of forces you uh, to submit your your part of the information and this to be compatible with the other information. And nobody can change ever the blockchain. So, from the moment it's constructed, mm -hmm. it's forever there. So, uh, you know, think about like I don't know, uh, submitting your code there, submitting like uh, you know your your model, and then the other has to submit his model and. Of course, this has to be seen how exactly it's been done, but think about an interconnectivity. So, uh, if if your your model doesn't fit with with it's an, uh, it's not an extension of the previous model. If it's not a continuation, if it doesn't follow the same standard, it will be rejected by the mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. And the blockchain, it's a think like an open database, an open database where where it's distributed, so nobody can uh, at least uh, theoretically you know, take it down or destroy it mm -hmm. or, or hack the system. Mm -hmm. So maybe but, uh, wait, for wait the do you, uh, Sorry, but can you, uh, where do you run a blockchain? I mean, how is it possible to set up uh, such a uh, inf framework or environment? Okay, so practically uh -huh. you would have to, everybody can do a blockchain, mm -hmm. you, you can start your own blockchain, but uh, practically to keep it alive, you have uh, miners, so the people who submit um, mm -hmm. The, the, the people who submit new parts in the blockchain and then you also need uh, a digital currency that you create mm -hmm. um, and you use to pay the system so to sustain the system you create a currency mm -hmm. and you sustain it by giving value to this mm -hmm. currency so you and can the also come up with a it. completely new cryptocurrency which of course i mean there are hundred the, the, there's mm -hmm. hundreds out there mm -hmm. i think they're around 1700 almost now and is something related to geoscience or remote sensing mm, no um i don't know if i mean i i don't know all of the projects maybe some of them they're related somehow but mm. i mean I'm, it's just a very good way to to have a very open and transparent way to validate information so many um, state agencies now for example they're thinking putting all the public information on the blockchain so mm. everybody can test it everybody can see it it's a very transparent mm -hmm. way you cannot alter it from the moment you create it mm. so this creates a lot of transparency mm. a anyway i mean it's it's a very very far-reaching idea but mm. you know um, I, I just mentioned it, it as a way to interconnect between the the projects yes okay mm.
Okay. So this is uh, interesting in terms of remote sensing. Mm -hmm. So regarding the future of AI into uh, the the field of, of geodata and remote sensing, mm -hmm. where do you see things going? What do you think about deep learning? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not so much familiar with deep learning like you are. I'm more a traditional machine learner guy. So um, definitely I want to have the whole world labeled <laughs> 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 with thousands of classes and I mean, for me, what's the most, and for you also, I know, is the most important thing is how to sustain a good model, how to transfer it, you know, or how can even how you can even update it, you know, it, maybe it's, you don't even uh, need to build a completely new model, but how to update the already existing model and how to um, transfer it, because we in remote sensing we are working with the Earth, planet Earth, so it's a big, big planet and. Uh, a lot of uh, variance in the data, uh, depending on latitude and position, and uh, also type of uh, things that we see. So but we need transferability of the model. Definitely. Sorry to interrupt you, but yeah. there is exactly what I see deep learning fitting perfectly mm -hmm. because f yes. we know, for example, that huge breakthroughs have happened in the imaging yes. sector, uh, in computer vision, and uh, I don't know medical imaging. Now there mm -hmm. are huge breakthroughs with deep learning. Yes. We know these are the best models. We know that yes. these models can process huge data. So again, a very important aspect regarding the the extent of the data. We say we, we, we always mm -hmm. say in remote sense we have so many data, how are we gonna pros process them? And you have models that they can process large data. The more yes. data you have, the better for these mm -hmm. kind of models. And then you also have the other aspect of transferability. And uh, I just want to mention this for, mm -hmm. for our viewers, transferability of the model is like, um, uh, at least what we mean here is like, okay, I train a model to semantically segment, uh, I don't know, Germany, yeah, and okay. how can I use this model in US? Would it have the same accuracy if I move mm -hmm. it to Africa? Uh, do do I have to retrain it? Do you know how easy to adapt it to yes, to, exactly. to these different scenes? Yes. So I mean, going back to deep learning, I mean deep learning seems to have all these uh, properties that you are asking for: uh, capacity to to work with big data, uh, possibility to mm -hmm. uh, be transferred. At least that's that's uh, the lessons we learned from mm -hmm. from the computer vision community. And so so I don't see why companies and why people like you who m move between academia and the companies are a little bit, I don't know, try to avoid this thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, w w or, or maybe other companies are not doing that. Tell us a little bit about that. I mean, I mean what's not, your... No, no, uh, well, first of all, we're not trying to, um, uh, let's say, avoid it, but what I encountered with, with deep learning on convolutional networks to work with hi very high resolution data is very expensive also. So. I mean, what do you mean by expensive? No, I mean in terms of money. So we use mostly um, free data, Copernicus data, and also the same. But you can use it for any kind of data. I mean, the, it's not for very high resolution data. It's it's for any kind of image data. Okay, um, but also it depends also on your target of your goal setting. What do you want to achieve with such a model? I mean, if you have a two class problem maybe it's uh, already enough to use a simple neural network but you know? before you said exactly the opposite <laughs> you said you want to have the world map with yes, thousands of classes yeah, of and i i don't think yes. uh, so many cases we have binary problems and mm. for example uh, there was a very interesting article i haven't presented it here because the channel just started but uh, there was a blog post from facebook that they uh, did very good uh, at least the blog post was saying that they did very good work in um, mapping the whole world in a binary image, mm -hmm. saying what's uh, what's a building and what's not. Okay, uh, uh, urban footprint basically. So yes, but uh, practically they they did it with very high spatial uh, spatial resolution data mm -hmm. from WorldView, and uh, even for these two class problem as you mentioned mm -hmm. they use the CNNs or convolutional okay. neural networks mm -hmm. that I presented uh, okay. a little bit in the previous uh, mm -hmm. uh, video mm -hmm. so regarding this I mean you see mm -hmm. even binary problems being tackled with, with these mm -hmm. kind of models why would you argue that this is not a good idea 
Mm. No, I didn't say that's not a good idea. Just so you said, uh, uh, yeah. Anyway, so so. Okay. Yeah. Now, for example, uh, uh, have you used uh, also um, CNNs on uh, temporal data or on time series data? Of course, but not CNNs. Then you use LSTMs, mm -hmm. and in academia, there are very very interesting works on that. Uh, mm -hmm. And maybe I will presenting something like that in the following episodes because mm -hmm. I really have found some very interesting resources and mm -hmm. I think this would be uh, interesting for many of our viewers mm -hmm. as a topic. But yeah, anyway, uh, you don't use exactly uh, convolutional neural networks, you use LSTMs or long short term memory networks, which is another type of deep learning mm -hmm. models. Mm -hmm. or there were some studies uh, suggesting even to use temporal convolution, which is yet another model. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, oh, deep learning is just a framework and people sometimes think uh, mm -hmm. that uh, deep learning is only convolutional networks, but that's not the case. Mm -hmm. There's many different types of models for many different purposes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So w have you seen anybody in the uh, industry working with mm. deep learning or yes uh, yes I mean I mean what what, uh, what we are using it for is to um, uh, improve actually the cloud mask and uh, cloud shadow um, avoidance of uh, the uh, images so we have uh, a lot of atmospheric correction uh, programs like ArcC I think it's open source uh, software and then you have uh, this uh, Pi 6s and the LEDAPS uh, tool for Alansat and they have of course the Send to Core. Wh what are all these? Is, uh, models? These are all different atmospheric correction uh, softwares and models for different sensors and Send to Core, Sentinel correction uh, tool is one of the most prominent ones that emerged recently but still you know it's not perfect so of course uh, no yeah. models are I mean perfect no model is perfect so but uh, let's say if you want to improve it then you need also to 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 do some um, work on your own so definitely uh, one of the um, one of the let's say most uh, po popular things to do is uh, deep learning with co convolutional neural networks in terms of cloud masking and cloud uh, recognition yes okay mm. it because of serious clouds you know the i'm not talking about the simple white uh, clouds uh, i'm talking about this uh, complex uh, serious clouds and haze and uh, aerosols and stuff like that okay and where do you see um the next 10 years would lead us uh, at, at let's say in the market field where where, where do you see things going oh i don't know <laughs> <laughs> of course, it's always a challenging uh, <laughs> thing to predict the future, uh, but... Uh, I don't know. Uh, what would be nice, for example, is to, um, to see that um, this technical uh, uh, evolution also takes place in uh, developing countries such as, let's say, Uzbekistan, uh, Ethiopia, Burkina Faso, where actually have so many talented people and a lot of human resources and where education is uh, st still, let's say, um, ah, how to say, it's still, it's a very important thing and we need to Im improve uh, the educational uh, resources in this country so we just can equalize the... Yes, just, just to mention here, also Dimo, when I was working in yeah. academia, he was doing a lot of tutoring uh, in in yes. different countries yes. in Asia, summer school. So and and you you had the students from all over the world. No, from from Central Asia basically, and what was also <laughs> the first thing before uh, before um, any other things. Uh, first for having education, uh, learning a lot of languages. Okay, at least two or three languages. This is very important. You mean foreign languages. Foreign languages because yes, they yes. could be programming languages. Ah, <laughs> no, actually, you need only Python. You don't need okay. More. <laughs> no, but definitely you need to learn a lot of foreign languages, to be open, to travel a lot, to see the world, to see other people, and then oh, this also belongs to education. And then how to how otherwise can we equalize uh, education in the countries? You know, so harmonize it. You know? So, w what is the current situation with education? Now? system in these countries well, why do you say it's a very big challenge i mean uh, are, are there lacking no not, not like how to say yes there are a lot of uh, development aid programs who want to improve the situation but it takes also a lot of time to having an uh, open society open democratic society where young people are also willing to travel or to interchange with others or to learn the, uh, another language and takes time to learn a language you know it cannot do it overnight 
and also to have also the technical uh, equipment, the resources, it takes also time. It's so you think there's a lack, for example, in the computational resources in this country? Yes, of course. Even yes, because yes, even yes, today yes. with a simple laptop, you, I mean, you can do some quite uh, uh, good processing of data. Yeah, but the second biggest thing is exactly this, the technical gap, the technical lack of uh, uh, equipment. Okay. If you are, uh, let's say, a remote sensing specialist who is interested to map the deforestation in uh, some uh, tropical countries in Africa, so of course you, you can do it w manually with QGIS and, 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 and use some Lancet images, but the problem starts with getting the data. So th the third problem, beside the technical equipment, is the internet connection. So it's, it's a huge problem of getting gigabytes, big data, terabytes of data, it's which is um, sometimes it takes. Okay, two of days course. Time, two days to download one image. Of course, I'm I'm, I'm not uh, saying yeah. that these people should necessarily start with terabytes of data, but I'm yeah. just talking like about really. But but, uh, but if you want to map the deforestation of a country, you need uh, at least some gigabytes of data, and that's already the problem. So the internet connection uh, stops people from actually so learning. Even the, uh, so even the universities uh, don't have. Good no, no, no. no. Uh, for example, one. Uh, I don't want to mention uh, <laughs> details, but uh, there was a point where we have to disconnect all computers from a building to at least have uh, 128 kilobyte per second connection. So it's very, very, uh, very crazy problems. We in, in need to ensure first this, and then we can ensure the rest. You know? And uh, yeah. so I guess this is also it's a bottleneck for things such as. Uh, the people from these countries, the, the people who want to educate themselves looking at our channel or looking at other educational courses online, yes, in Coursera, yes, exactly. in Udacity. Exactly. When I'm doing a course, let's say in uh, Uzbekistan or Kyrgyzstan, and then um, I'm explaining a method for uh, image classification or uh, object-based uh, classification, uh, segmentation or something. So. And then people ask me, you know, okay, but how is it possible, or what is the details, or what tell us um, something more, or um, can you please repeat, and then, um, or when can I get the data, or you know, some very trivial questions which can be answered in seconds by using Google. But uh, you first, when you're not used to use the internet, you're also not used to help yourself, you know, you c um, because research means... You're, you're expecting from the professor, for example, or the yes, tutor yes, to, to yes, sell you everything. That's a problem. And in our countries here, research means you're doing your own research. You're responsible for your own data, your own research, your own knowledge, your gathering. Your projects, you learn how to yes. work in teams yes. to, to exactly. find the solutions yourself. Yes, you're not uh, waiting for the answer. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem. So first, you so have to learn not to wait for the answer and then to search it. But it's kind of old school. Yeah. Like in the past, you know, you would have the, I guess, yes. the, the, the professor who knew everything and you would ask him because there was no other easy exactly. source of information yes. or you would spend all your afternoon in the library searching for one line of information. Yes. There, there are many tutorials in the internet and many uh, Kaggle competitions, uh, so it's... <laughs> maybe maybe you can give us some links to, if you know some tutorials, would be uh, interesting to add them here below. Uh, next time, next time. <laughs> <laughs> next time. Uh, so, uh, going towards the end of, of uh, yes. these uh, but nice interviews... Sorry, can I ask something about how do you see the uh, future? How do I see the future uh, of remote sensing? Yes, of yes, yes. Uh, I mean, you have to be a little bit more specific. No, I mean th to ask you the same question back, like you ask. You know, I mean, what's the? Uh, how do you see the situation in the remote sensing society in, let's say, five years? I mean, I'm I'm more coming from the academia, so I think my mm -hmm. my opinions are more biased towards the and and affected heavily by by the academia. But um, mm -hmm. w what is also the purpose of this channel is. Like I think there is really a big, big gap between what we discover and how much could be beneficial for the people into industry. And uh, even if we sometimes open source a project, uh, the people from the companies are a little bit skeptical or they think it's too high level for them to even touch it mm. or you know, too complicated to deal with it. So they say, okay, let's use the old method I used to work with yes. and I know it from 10 years ago. Mm. And, but but uh, then you, you are kind of missing 
all these part of, uh, of, of the big breakthroughs. Mm. And if you don't use this, you will be uh, surpassed by someone else who comes. But it's also a matter of resources. Let's say if my, if my uh, support vector machine uh, works faster than your uh, deep uh, neural network, then I will take it because it will save money. <laughs> But um, <laughs> generally support vector machines are considered very slow classifiers. Ah, it depends on how many um, inputs you have and how many variables. Yeah, okay, of course. Features, I mean, we, we can doubt, um, but because uh, yeah. neural networks work on GPUs, the inference is very, very but, fast. But you but need but first to have GPUs. If you don't yeah. have GPUs, what But is nowadays it's becoming a commodity. You can, mm. I mean, I was saying in the previous uh, video that you can buy a, a little bit older version of Titan X GPU mm. from NVIDIA, which is like one of the top GPUs you can use for these kind of problems with a thousand euros. I mean, mm. nowadays, I think you spend more than 1000 euros for a laptop. So mm. having uh, like uh, 1000 euro GPU for running a very big model with very high accuracy, I mean, it's, it's not so much anymore, um, at least here in Europe, to, uh, for companies, it shouldn't be a, a burden. I mean, probably mm -hmm. the, the, the desks you are sitting and the chair you use in your yes, companies yes, yes. are more expensive <laughs> than, than the and, and, the and the prices are going yes, down. So, yes. um, what what yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so you want mm -hmm. uh, just to continue on the topic mm -hmm. uh, because we, we got a little bit out of uh, you asked me what do I see in the future? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I see this very big gap. Uh, I, s I see that, for example, at least my feeling is that in US. Um, the the industry is moving faster. You see many companies mm -hmm. adapting to deep learning, adaptive to mm -hmm. um, these new technologies generally. Whereas uh, in in Europe we, we we tend to have companies with a lower level of expertise, and and in mm -hmm. a globalized world, in a globalized market, of course, this creates problems because it's it's it it kills uh, the. Uh, the, the companies in Europe. I mean, in the in the end, if if another company would come and offer a better price and a better service in a globalized world, I mean, it's just a matter of sending information. And if the information is in the cloud, I mean, there's not even a problem of uh, transmission anymore. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think the European at least companies should do a little bit better. They should speed up. They should adapt better into the new trends <coughs> that is coming mm -hmm. out there. And uh, my argument is not just focused because I'm from the academia and I say so. We see huge, huge benefits in the market, in the computer vision community, mm -hmm. because they actually adapted to these kind of models from academia. Yes, yes, yes. So I would expect the same or even bigger benefits in remote sensing. Mm -hmm. And uh, also um, to not forget about the government sector, which I think has the biggest, uh, let's say, biggest gap in this. Is especially in Germany, um, a lot of uh, projects uh, related to remote sensing, even conventional, traditional remote sensing, are outsourced to companies. And some parts, let's say the forestry services, have somehow um, adopted to this uh, Copernicus uh, trend, to the Copernicus uh, services, which emerged uh, a couple of years ago. But definitely um, all the other um, government sectors, which would also benefit a lot from uh, um, computer vision and remote sensing, um, are still very much behind because it's much easier for them to outsource it. I mean, besides the forestry uh, guys who are really have strong interest in doing so, but still also what I have seen there is that the, uh, the there is a um, high um, under um, how do you say uh, under. Um, capacity of the of the departments you know you could also hire much more people to do the job you know yeah so I, i think it's a general problem here in europe generally also for the people who are looking here they can comment uh in the comment section below the video but i really think in europe we have a problem with um with with funding in the field of remote sensing so mm -hmm. uh if if you open any big website of, mm -hmm. of jobs and and you type in remote sensing job it's all only i don't know 95 percent of of what you get is related with academia it's always like yes, oh yes. phd opening uh, and yes. and uh, but, but remote sensing mm -hmm. it's not 
in my opinion, just part yes. of the academia. As we said, it's a very practical uh, science, at, at least when it comes to image, ex uh, to information extraction from mm -hmm. images, for creating maps, for creating uh, useful data for yes. the society. Yes. Yes. So uh, this shouldn't just belong to, to a sphere of academic mm -hmm. people. This should be a part of, of we should have it's more job openings yeah. uh, in, in the community. We should have uh, bigger funding from the European yes. towards startups of this and field. And bigger interconnectivity also of people yes. uh, through each other. But also, let's say the government, uh, just to give one more example, imagine you're a state, a federal state of Austria or uh, Germany, and you are doing the whole airborne uh, monitoring with uh, photogrammetric uh, images of uh, orthophotos of the whole country, even in, in four bands, we have uh, RGB plus uh, near infrared. And uh, you have like a 20 centimeter resolution, which is already very high, and you have all, all covered all the uh, federal state, and you have all the data, you produce all this data, also um, including laser scan also. So you have a DSM. In the okay, end, it yeah. doesn't really but matter, you have very detailed uh, so data. So you have all the data, and you have uh, spent a lot of money to get to this point, and then you outsource it to a company, because you are not able to uh, analyze or process this data that you captured yourself so that's a um, big gap and the thing the solution to this just hire two three More four people. people in this department of GIS uh, where actually uh, usually the federal GIS guys work doing the cadastral uh, and the um, topographic maps just hire three four geomatics or remote sensing people who can actually do this job which has been outsourced and then it's gone the knowledge is also gone you know so yeah okay yes um because we've talked uh, long, uh, I think we should go towards the end, but I, I want to ask you a last question. So, uh, what is your wish for this channel? What what you would you like to see in the future and where do you see it going? I mean, do you mm. think it's helpful? Do you find it beneficial? Very much. I'm very much looking to it. Support this guy, he's <laughs> the best. And also, I, what I want would like to see are uh, um, because all my colleagues are watching the channel also as well I told them <laughs> and um, now what we want to see also some experimental stuff I mean uh, discussing papers on the one side but also on the other side also experimenting with data and and doing just some uh, also yeah so maybe some, some um, beneficial experiments which are let's say not make it into a paper but maybe to to share some ideas to share um, some yeah some new new ideas and concepts yeah, would be interesting okay so yes. you don't have any very specific uh, request for the future I mean you just want to see more research yes yes uh, also uh, about discussing papers let's say I'm very much interested as we said um, about um, discussing different uh, different yeah, different how to say uh, approaches to labeling the data and experimenting with um, generalization so how much actually labels are needed to produce a certain result and um, it's actually about the semantic uh, resolution how many classes actually are needed how many classes are possible or um, as I said is um, dimensionality reduction is a nice topic in terms of time series analysis so they're different topics but I would go definitely first of or for um, dealing with labeling you know, so less deep learning more labels yeah. that's that's it oh no both man i'm both, kidding i'm yeah, kidding both. yeah I, I just wanted to make okay. a joke yes. okay so i think uh, we had a nice conversation we talked yeah. about many topics from government to the european condition to the future of companies to what's happening out there to, to the problems of the market, a little bit about the funding, the jobs. Um, I think we had a good overview. Um, I would like to thank you for joining us here in AI in Space Tech. Thank you very uh, much. Support the channel. It's yes. Very good. Uh, subscribe, give us your feedback. Um, give us your, your positive feedback, your negative feedback if you didn't like it. If uh, Tell us what you would like to see in the future, if you would like to have more interviews or more scientific content um and yeah with this um i think we come to the end uh thank you dimo again for joining us thank you dimitris yes 
Maybe yes. you will provide some tutorials for yes, the future, I would also links. Actually, tutorials. actually, we could continue for the next uh, sessions to do some tutorials or live experiments. Yes. And then we see, oh, it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, let's, let's see. Yeah. Uh, okay. We have many ideas. Uh, let's see how we put them down. Yes. Uh, it depends also on uh, the people, if the mm. people are interested, if the people um, are joining the mm. these, these uh, endeavor, then we can do many stuff, but uh, <laughs> if they're not interested, then uh, w I, I think I will just stop. <laughs> now we just continue. Okay. For our okay. So, uh, thank you very much, guys, for uh, seeing this video and yep, goodbye. Goodbye, people.